आर लाइव नमस्कार सुस्वागतम केम छो आदाबाज गुड आफ्टरनून आप सभी का पी आर एल के अमृत व्याख्यान में स्वागत है अभिनंदन है ए वेरी वॉम वेलकम फ्रॉम मी अनिल भारद्वाज फॉर द पी आर एल का अमृत व्याख्यान टूडे इज द फोर्टी नाइन्थ व्याख्यान ऑफ द सीरीज ऑफ सेवेंटी फाइव व्याख्यान विच इज बींग ऑर्गेनाइज एज अ पार्ट ऑफ पी आर एल सेवेंटी फाइव ईयर्स ऑफ लेगेसी एंड हिस्ट्री इन फंडामेंटल फिजिक्स एंड स्पेस साइंसिस इस्टेब्लिश इन द ईयर नाइनटीन फोर्टी सेवन by the father of indian space program dr vikram sarabhai the prl pratyam jubli coincides with india's 75 years of independence so it's a joint celebration of the development of science and technology in india by prl under the banner of prl ka amrit vyakhyan today we have yet another very distinguished vyakhyan karta professor shubhat tole who is uh, in the department of uh, biological sciences at tata institute of fundamental research in mumbai she is going to speak on the circuits of sensation how we perceive the words we greatly thank and appreciate professor shubhatole for accepting our invitation and to be with us when we are celebrating prl 75 years so prl ka amrit vyakhya I would now request my colleague Professor Shubhavati to kindly introduce our Vakhan Karta of today, and also to the Webex panel as well as the YouTube channel of PRL. There are audience who have joined us not just on the Webex panel but also on the YouTube channel of PRL. May I now request Professor Shubhavati to kindly introduce the speaker? Thank you, Professor Bharadwaj. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Professor Shubha Tole to the audience. Professor Tole obtained her B.Sc. in Life Sciences and Biochemistry from Saint Xavier's College, Mumbai, in 1987. Her M.Sc. and Ph.D. are from Caltech, U.S.A. She worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Chicago and then joined the Tata Institute in Mumbai as a faculty member in 1999. Professor Tole is a recipient of the Infosys Science Foundation Award for Life Sciences in 2014, the Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award in 2010, the Research Award for Innovation in Neurosciences from the Society for Neuroscience in 2008, the National Women Bioscientist Award from the Department of Biotechnology Government of India in 2008. The Shornu Jayanti Fellowship awarded by the Department of uh, Science and Technology in 2005. and the welcome trust senior international fellowship in 1999 she is an elected fellow of all the three science academies in india professor tole believes that communicating science is an is as important as pursuing it active and actively engages in public outreach via workshops in schools colleges and uh, writes blogs aimed at helping students and postdocs plan the, their careers and i have read some of these blogs they are really well written so i would like to request the audience that you know please go through it especially you know young uh, women i would like to request and uh, because she also takes an active interest in issues related to diversity and inclusion and she is currently the chair of the you know, women in science panel of the indian academy of sciences and is also a member of the inter academy panel of women in stem and as a part of this i got some chance to interact with her uh, last year um, and i hope that you know it will be not uh, uh, online and there will be scope of offline interaction and with this uh, let me um, uh, invite professor tole to give her very interesting vyakhyan thank you so very much prabhati very kind introduction and i too look forward to in person interactions uh thank you to the prl community and the organizers of this vyakhyan for inviting me um i'm i'm very happy to visit prl uh, albeit virtually i was just saying that when i was a very new junior faculty uh, the prl colloquium organizer then was kind enough to invite me to give a colloquium in 2001 and i remember having a very stimulating question session and so on and i hope for a similar one in this case as well so 
I will begin my talk and I will say, let's keep it informal. If uh, I say something that is, you know, confusing enough that you would like to ask a question right away, please do. It's not a problem. Uh, it's more important that we have a discussion than that I give a, a bhashan. So with that, let me begin. Okay, is my slide visible? Yes. yes. All right. Uh, I'm delighted to talk about a subject that uh, drives the fascination of almost everybody. Who isn't interested in the brain? Uh, who isn't interested in how this fantastic organ executes its complex functions? Because at the end of the day, everything that we do that is worth doing, that we consider worthwhile, um, whether it is engineering or mountaineering, whether it is uh, uh, art, creative uh, fine arts or creative scientific arts, I place science right amongst those things that need creativity. All of these are executed by the circuits we see before us. This uh, beautiful color map is actually all of the wires, the circuitry, the nerves in the human brain. And I've taken it from the Human Connectome Project. Uh, the way this is imaged is it's diffusion tensor imaging where essentially, to simplify things, though uh, I'm sure the physicists in the audience know more about this than I do, um, the alignment of the water molecules along the tracts are imaged. And every time a tract changes direction, uh, uh, it gets color coded uh, in a different color. So that's how this wonderful image is produced. Now, this is the human brain. It is not a model system for anything. <laughs> we study simpler brains. Uh, the model system of my choice in my lab is the mouse, which I will talk about a little later. But first, let me set up why the circuitry of the brain is important to study. The circuitry of the brain is important to study simply because how our sensory perception is brought to our brains controls how we perceive the world, controls what we know about the world. Without our five senses, we really don't, I mean, we are not in touch with anything outside. We, the world is brought into us through the senses. That says, imagine what a huge job these senses have. And um, on the one hand, there's too much information out there. On the other hand, only a small fraction of it is actually presented to the brain. And it's a quest matter of philosophy to discuss how the brain actually thinks it knows what's out there. Okay, we think we know what's out there, but do we really? Excuse me. And this is what I'm going to challenge you with. For example, what colors are these flowers? Okay, now most people would say this is not a trick question. This lower flower is yellow, the upper flower is purple on the outside and white on the uh, towards the center, right? This is not a trick question. But you know, what color is the flower? Really depends on who's looking. I don't need to tell this audience about how big the electromagnetic spectrum is and what a tiny fraction of that is actually visible to us, right? So this, this uh, photographer, Jean Rosslet, um, has photographed many things using ultraviolet light, okay? And using ultraviolet light, now we still can't see ultraviolet light, so how is he gonna show it to us? It's false color. But the ultraviolet illumination uh, reveals anisotropies in the structure, okay? Inhomogeneities in the structure of the flower, and false color, here is what the flower might look like to say an insect which can perceive ultraviolet light. And you can see how the, the, the sort of uh, radial symmetry is useful to an insect. After all, the job the insect wants to do is to get to the center of the flower where the nectar is. And these kinds of uh, um, uh, anisotropies in the structure of the petal, uh, the, the, the structure of the scales that form the petals and so on, are likely to be useful for the bee that's trying to find the center of the flower. Okay, and yet we go around happily thinking, oh, lovely yellow flowers, lovely purple flowers. What yellow, what purple? What color is the flower? It depends on who's looking, no? It really depends on who's looking. And here, we are humans are so sure we know. Okay, we're so sure we know what's out there. Now, as scientists, 
we know that there is more out there than our five senses can perceive. We have invented microscopes and telescopes and imaging and this and that and the other wavelength to see what's out there, right? So that's, we sort of parcelate that into the realm of science. But hey, what's presented to our brains is this, limited by our five senses. And I'm going to motivate this in the next few slides, this theme, because the focus of my work is how the circuitry of the brain gets wired up. How does it grow to get connected correctly so that sensory information may be brought to the cortex? So that's the focus of my work. And I'm going to set up the importance of studying why sensory circuitry is important using another few slides, which I hope you will enjoy. Uh, for example, this is a popular illusion. It's called a Kanitsa illusion, a Kanitsa square. And I think most people would agree that it looks like there is a white, you know, card paper in a square placed upon what might be four black circles. This is what the illusion looks like. And I'm telling you it's an illusion. Uh, I'm telling you that even though I'm telling you it's an illusion, no eye in the audience will fail to see that there appears to be a slight color difference between the white of the square and the white of the background. Yeah, if this was a physical audience, I would have done a show of hands. Uh, I think you can see this boundary and you can see that there's a little bit of difference between the two whites. Is it? Okay, now I'm doing nothing to this image. I'm just going to overlay one by one squares that simply remove the black. Okay, and you can see there is actually no contrast difference here. I've not done any alteration to this. Okay, but that boundary just didn't exist. Okay, that boundary just didn't exist. I'm going to transit to now this. Uh, people may or may not like cats, but you will surely find this very interesting that cats will try and fit themselves into objects, into squares, into rectangles. They somehow like to do this. And in fact, this is a, this is a behavior called if I fit, I sit. And during the lockdown, a scientist, Gabriella Smith in New York, conducted this very, very small experiment by mail, okay, uh, with people who own cats. So she mailed these little kits to people, cat owners. The N was small, but I'm just using this to make the point about visual illusions. She simply mailed kits where she had people mark out squares on the floor, okay, and mark out tape in a control shape. It wasn't an enclosed square and simply score in, you know, time windows where their cats would sit. And it turned out that the cats more reliably sat inside squares that were just marked on the floor. Okay, they weren't boxes and so on. Then not. Okay, now that was interesting. But here's what's going to blow your mind when he did this experiment. The Kanitsa square. Here is the control on this side. And here is the Kanitsa square. The cats with some preference sat in this illusory square more often than this. Right, which means a cat can see this, which begins to, you know, make you wonder why is our brain wired up to see these illusions? Why is our brain wired up to see things that aren't actually there? Okay, and here I will invoke one of the greats of uh, systems neuroscience, okay, Jeldard, who in fact posited that illusion is the perceptual rule and not the exception. Now, what do I mean by that? Okay, our brains are making up things all the time and they have to, to give us the, to, to make some sense of this world that's coming at us. Okay, what do I mean by that? If our brains were to image things and only present what they saw, then tell me, would our brain tell us that there is a bottle behind these bars? The most sort of sparse and accurate description of this image is that there is a bit of plastic here with a green cap. And then it's broken and then there's another bit of plastic here and then there's a plastic with a green label and then it's broken and then you know what I mean. Right, but we know there's a bottle there it would be foolish to imagine there isn't our brains construct an entire bottle out of bits of image that aren't there. Okay. One thing our brain is brilliant at is if this bottle were to move. So if there were many, many bottles behind a bar, the ones that moved, our brain would group the moving objects together into one image. And why do we need to do this? Why does our brain need to do these contortions? Well, survival, okay? Frank survival. <laughs> Imagine how it would be if 
we failed to perceive there is a tiger amongst all these hidden parts, okay, we would certainly be no more. Our genes would die. Any circuitry that couldn't, couldn't properly construct a tiger behind this would be immediately selected out. And any tiger who could not perceive that there is an intact animal here behind these would die of hunger, right? I'm saying our brains continuously need to feed us sensory information and then make some sense of it. Okay, and we fall prey to these lovely Kanitsa squares and illusions because our circuitry is wired up to construct images that make sense to us. Okay, so this is a, a plug for uh, um, visual perception. And I use vision to motivate uh, sensory perception because we are very visual animals. Okay, all animals are not visual. Mice, which I study, are in fact olfactory and sensory animals. They don't see very well, but the senses all operate similarly. So I'm using the visual system as an example. Okay. And I'm going to now show you about how we, our brains, are wonderful at trying to make sense even across modalities. When you can't hear somebody very well, say in a busy party, if you can see their lips move, you can somehow hear them better. You try and see the face of the person, and then you can suddenly hear better. And in this day and age of masks, it's a perfect controlled experiment. If somebody has a mask, you suddenly stop hearing them. How many of you have had this example, right? <laughs> right? So now I'm going to show you how. Um, we basically see sound, okay? This is an experiment called the McGurk effect. And I'm going to simply ask you to think for yourself what sound you hear when I play this video. Ba, 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 ba. So this is again, not a trick slide. This person was simply saying pa, 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 okay? Baby sounds, that's all. If you, if you heard anything different, talk to me afterwards. <laughs> okay, I'm going to play you this other video. And again, it's baby sounds. It's nothing complicated. Ba, 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 ba. Now, even though I know what's coming, and even if you know what's coming, I cannot fail but hear this soundtrack as pa, 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 okay? Either pa or ba, okay? But consistent with the lips ba, okay? Now, you know what's coming. The soundtrack was the same. The soundtrack absolutely was the same. I'm going to play it again here now. And one face is going to say pa, pa, pa. The other face is going to say pa, pa, pa. And what I'm going to ask you to do is look at the one, look at the other, close your eyes. When you close your eyes, you will hear the soundtrack as the soundtrack is alone. And watch how seeing the face make either or actually changes your percept of the sound. Ba, 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 ba. So I wish I could do a show of hats. I would love to see how many people sort of, well, if, if you did, uh, how do you say it, succumb to this illusion, this cross-modality illusion, it means your circuits are doing fine, okay? <laughs> this is how the circuits are meant to function. We are supposed to use our senses to make sense of the world. To make sense of the world, we want to know what people are saying around us. And if the visual helps hearing, then hey, those circuits have wired up correctly. All right, so my point is, again, that the sensory information that is presented to our brains is what we have to work with. And therefore, sensory circuitry is important to understand how information is presented to the brain. And sensory circuitry and its growth is the focus of my talk. Okay, so. Ba, ba. So, my interests are in how an embryo creates this fantastic computer, okay? This is an embryo, it's actually an amphibian embryo, and you can see this tiny, tiny cells, each little granular thing is a cell. You can see how much movement there is. And what's going to form now is a large canal. This canal is actually the neural tube, which will form the spinal cord down here, and up front, it's going to form the brain. Okay, so you can see in the side view, the front of it bulges out to form the brain. This is how our entire central nervous system develops. So my lab does with me what they call the dance of the neural tube. 
you have a sheet of cells that rolls up and the, and the, the bottom part of the sheet remains slender, it forms a spinal canal with the cerebrospinal fluid in the middle and the front simply bulges out to form the two lobes of the brain. So, our, our, so topologically, our entire central nervous system is a tube and this tube has to create all of the hardware. It has to create all the neurons, the switches as it were, and have them grow wires to connect with each other because it is in those connections that, um, how do you say it, that the code runs, okay? The software code that uh, executes our perceptual functions. Now, I'm going to cover two things in my talk, sharing some of my work. Uh, to build an effective brain, you need to first ask how are brain sections, uh, brain structures positioned correctly. You have to create the right bits of things where you need them. And you're growing out of this sheet of cells that's moving and forming tube and so on, right? So this I will come to second. First, I will talk about how does sensory circuitry get wired up correctly? Okay, so these are the two elements of my talk where I will be showing a little bit of data. Is everybody uh, good with me so far? Please stop me and ask, okay, because it's important that, that I take you with. Okay, so here then is one neuron and all the red, so the neuron, this is the cell body, the output wire of this neuron, the axon is actually not seen in this picture. There's one output wire. All of these are input wires, the dendrites, and each red dot is where some other neuron has come and connected to this one. Okay, so, so the scope of all of this is that the brain has about 100 billion such neurons, the human brain, and each of them makes between 1,000 and 10,000 connections. So this is an engineering nightmare. Okay, this is an engineering, seriously nightmare, and this is how you get this. Now, we study it in a simpler system. We study it in the mouse. So if that were the human brain, the human cerebral cortex, this is the mouse brain. And we're going to study the sensory pathway. So from the eyes, from the ears, from the skin, okay, touch sensation, all of it gets funneled to a central relay station in the brain, a bilaterally symmetric one. I'm showing you only one half. So this line is the midline. And this relay center is in the middle. So I'm showing you only one side of it, this green dot, which is the relay center. And from this relay center, modality-specific pathways come out such that the, the sensory modalities remain segregated. And no matter whether you're a mouse or a cat or a horse or a donkey or a human or a monkey, all mammals have it such that visual cortex is here, then sensory cortex, touch cortex, okay, then motor cortex, which executes movement, auditory cortex is on the side. So these modalities are mapped very properly. So for example, here the pink is visual cortex, okay? And the green is the touch cortex and the auditory one is the blue. So no matter which, and which mammal you are, this map is sacrosanct. It means every time a little mouse is gone on the street, it executes this map. Think about the robustness of this programming, right? And humans have a bigger brain and mice have a smaller brain, but when it's an embryo, when this whole patterning is being done, everything is small. So the pattern is laid out in the embryo, and that's what I study. How, when everything is small in the embryo, how is the basic blueprint laid out such that the visual cortex always is at the back and the sensory cortex is ahead of it and so on. Okay? So that's the second part of my talk. How do structures know where to form? For the first part of my talk, I'm going to ask, how does this wiring cable find its way to the cortex? Okay? So this is a cartoon, and I'm going to show you some real data now. This, okay, this green blob is actually this, now it's become a green line. This is green fluorescent protein, GFP, that has been, uh, uh, so a piece of DNA that encodes GFP has been put into this developing brain, this relay center here, such that the, when the nerve fibers come out of it, you can see this nice thin tract. So here is the cerebral cortex, this sheet of cells is the cerebral cortex, where the sensory processing happens, okay? So this tract, takes this nice path and enters the cerebral cortex here. And that's what we're going to talk about, okay? So what is sensation and what is high-res sensation? We all know that if we want a high-resolution image, we go out and buy a higher megapixel camera, right? The more processing power, the more pixels you devote to something, the better the resolution. Now the brain has the number of pixels it has, right? It has a number of processing units it has. So how would you, how would you maximize and optimize the functioning of the brain? Okay, you wouldn't take, say, the entire body 
and make it a one-to-one -one map with the brain. Because then you would have the same resolution everywhere, even where you don't need it. Okay. Do you need great resolution here in the middle of your neck? Okay. Resolution is the ability to tell two points apart. You don't need it in the middle of your neck, but you certainly need good resolution in your fingertips and you need good resolution in your lips. I mean, think of a baby, right? Everything they put into their mouth. Why? The mouth is where the best resolution is. <laughs> they can examine surfaces best using their mouths. So the, the, the body plans this very carefully and devotes different amount of cerebral cortical area to where most processing is needed, most resolution is needed. So for example, if I were to show you a picture of a human being, a human body scaled based on how much cortical area it has to process sensation, this is what you would see. Okay, this is called a homunculus. And you can see how the most cortical area is devoted to the lips and the tongue and certainly the forefingers and the thumb and so on. Whereas little unnecessary bits like the neck and the arm and so on, very low resolution. So this is how the brain optimizes its resources, simply giving more territory to some parts than the other. And so it does in the mouse. All of these mechanisms are evolutionarily conserved. This is a normal mouse. Now for a mouse, the whiskers are like fingers. Okay, so before a mouse actually enters a gap, it will stop at the gap and whisk to test if the gap is big enough for it. The whiskers aren't just random whiskers, they're actually specific numbers, just like we have five fingers. And each whisker accesses a certain part of the brain. But before that, let me tell you, this is how the mouse brain territory is divided up. The whiskers and the upper jaw and the lower jaw get the largest territory, much like us. And see how the forelimbs, because the mouse actually does things with its forelimbs, okay, when it picks up something it wants to eat and so on. The hind limbs and the rest of the body, not so much. Okay, in fact, the entire hind limb and the rest of the body may fit into one or two whisker areas, right? So you can see how utterly sensitive the mouse's whiskers are, okay? And each whisker essentially maps to one patch in the brain. So this is the pathway from the whisker through the relay centers to the cerebral cortex and the cortex being the processor. And you can see how the C2 whisker, so wonderful studies have been done classically where if the C2 whisker is ablated, this particular patch goes away because the innervation has been removed. Okay. Now these structures are called barrels and the barrel field of the mouse brain is a fantastic model system to study sensory perception, to study the growth of sensory innovation. So remember, up to now, what I've said is sensory perception is important because it brings the world to us. Sensory perception is achieved by the wiring pathway that brings the sensation to the brain. And here, the mouse whisker barrel field is a very good model system because it's large, it's accessible. You can tell that these barrels exist. Okay, so we're going to look at these whisker barrels now in the brain. Are there really barrels in the brain? What is this barrel? I showed you little, little circles. Well. The person who named them, Moosley and Van der Loos from Lausanne, Switzerland, may have, uh, you know, been in a beer brewery when they found <laughs> when they found these data in the morning. So essentially, if you stain up the mouse, this is an entire mouse embryo brain just looked at from the outside. Um, if you stain it up for a particular enzyme, cytochrome oxidase, you will find these little nice little barrel-like structures. And here's actual data. This is my student Ashwin Shetty's work. And you can see when you stain up this, this, if you just cut out this tissue and stain it up for this enzyme, you will see that in the center of each barrel where the, the sensory innervation comes in, those terminals of those nerves are rich in cytochrome oxidase, and that's why you see these barrels. Now, I'm going to cut to the chase. What Ashwin discovered in his thesis is he discovered a particular transcription factor. A transcription factor is a protein which binds DNA and controls the up or down regulation of downstream genes. Okay, so a master regulator works by controlling many, many subsidiary genes. So this particular transcription factor, when it is knocked out, when it is removed from the cortex, okay, this is what Ashwin found. This is Ashwin. He's now doing a postdoc at Harvard. Um, when this particular transcription factor LHX2 is knocked out, okay, there is hide no hair of a barrel to be seen. And now this is interesting because we only knocked out this transcription factor from the cortex. We didn't knock it out from the pathway that was coming in. Those neurons were just fine. 
We only remove the gene from the cortex. We have the technology to do so. This is a standard technology where you can knock a gene out only in a tissue of your choice. Okay, and this made us think it raised many interesting uh, features. So, for example, where was this knockout done? Only in the cortex. When was it done? Early in the embryo. And in which cells was it done? It was done in all the dividing stem cells which produce all the neurons of the brain. So, when this gene is removed in the mother cells that are going to produce the neurons that form the barrels, then for some reason, perfectly good nerves that are coming in from the relay center can't innovate and somehow don't form barrels. So, I mean, what is going on? Okay. This challenge was taken up by a PhD student, Suranjana Pal, who has just graduated and she's doing her postdoc in uh, Washington University, St. Louis. And Suranjana, in collaboration with some others in the lab, um, used a very cool technique of in utero electroporation. Okay, so this is the same picture you saw before, where I said that we had introduced a piece of DNA encoding green fluorescent protein, GFP, into this relay center so that these nerves could be labeled. That's how we can visualize it. Now, how did we introduce it? We introduced it when the embryo was in the uterus, in utero, and we did it by electroporation. This is Suranjana, and this is Gita Godbole and Tuli Pramani, who actually performed the electroporation. Electroporation is simply applying electric current. So the cells get developed little pores and the DNA that you've put goes in. <laughs> but this is a complex surgery. Okay, so for example, you have to inject the DNA into the, the ventricles, into the cavities of the brain. You have to apply the electric current. Here is an actual surgery for scales. So these are gloved fingers. This is actually the mother mouse. You can see the arms of the mother mouse. This is, it's lying on its belly up. So you can, this is its neck. The head would be here. And this, each little blob is an embryo, okay? This is the scale. Each embryo is less than a fingernail. And here is the capillary that is introducing the DNA. So this is a very difficult technique and the mouse is under surgical anesthesia, does not feel pain. Then you do the electroporation, you close it up and you let the pups get born. Then you examine them, okay? So now here is a normal mouse. One week old, you see these little blobs, which now you know are barrels. This is the normal mouse. And at high mag, this is what the barrels look like. If I show you this, this, this dark, uh, th this blazing patch of fibers coming in is the pathway that is coming into the cortex. And you can see how it has now branched off and has formed these lovely little blobs. Okay, so these barrels are normal. Now look at the mutant. Okay, here, the LHX2 was knocked out only in the cortex and in all the stem cells and all the mother cells. And look what's happened. There's hardly a barrel to be seen. But the pathway has made it, okay? The pathway has come all the way up to the cortex, but it's unable to project into the cortex. So something is wrong here. So we were wondering, okay, is it that the cortex is hostile? We've removed LHX2 from the cortex. Maybe it's hostile. Maybe it doesn't allow the innovation in. So to answer this, Suranjana looked a little earlier in the embryo when the pathway first reaches the cortex. And she expected there too, it first reaches the cortex and would not be able to do anything. But this, I have to tell you that when the pathway first reaches the cortex in the embryo, see, this is control, thick pathway has come in, it doesn't innovate into the cortex, it just lays in a nice cable underneath and it waits. Why does it wait? One reason, okay, the jury is out on why this waiting period has to be. But one reason, there's a four-day waiting period in the mouse. The mouse gestation is 19 days, the pathway has reached by 14 days, and it waits for five days. One reason is because the cells that it is actually going to innovate and form the barrels, okay, the cells that actually it's, it's going to touch are not actually there yet in place. So it has to wait obediently. What happens in the mutant? Amazingly, in the mutant, what Suranjana found is that there is no waiting. The fibers simply go into the cortex, rushing in headlong. They don't find their target because the target layer is not there yet. And because they don't find their target, presumably, the, the, the fibers begin to die and the cells that produce the fibers die with it. And that is why in postnatal life, we don't see any innovation because these rushed in when they should have been waiting. So now we have a problem. We have an interesting problem, right? You remove a particular gene from the cortex and suddenly incoming fibers, which were perfectly normal, they had the gene and everything, they suddenly rush in. What is the mechanism here? Okay, to answer this, Suranjana, focus. So here's just a high mag of it to show you that they really do rush in quite madly. 
Um, and this is an interesting contrast. Remember I said that here we have knocked out LHX2 from all the mother cells of the cortex. If you remove the same gene from neurons after they are born from the mother cells, nothing happens. You get a perfectly well-behaved cable that waits. So this is an interesting biological thing that, that some genes are important in the mother cells to program their daughter neurons so that they can behave normally. Okay, so this is a little bit of an interesting biological twist. But now I'm going, and this is quantitation, but it's kind of obvious, so I'm going to skip through it. I'm going to talk about why these fibers wait. And I'm going to introduce the subplate, which is like a park and hold array for incoming nerves. What do I mean? There's a cartoon. Okay, it's the same cartoon you saw before, just the axons are now red. The subplate is a layer of cells which receives these incoming nerves and says, wait. Your actual target up here is not there yet, wait. So we hypothesize that maybe in our mutant, this subplate might be in disarray. Because indeed, in other mutants that are known in the field, so these are the actual target cells, in other mutants that are known in the field where the subplate is mislocalized, this entire fiber tract goes and, you know, targets the subplate. In other mutants where the subplate is scattered around, these axons go and target the subplate. So we said, hey, maybe the subplate is, you know, mislocalized and all over the place. And that's why our nerves are going all the way into the cortex. Turns out very oddly, no. Here's control. Here is knockout in the neuron. You know, after the neuron is born, there's no problem with that mouse. And here is knockout in cortical stem cells. The subplate is a little fluffy. And maybe one or two cells here and there, but broadly it's in place. So we have an interesting issue where this subplate is born from progenitors in which LHX2 wasn't there. And when it is born from progenitors in which LHX2 is not there, only then the nerves don't seem to notice the subplate is there. So what property is it of this subplate that is unable to hold these nerves? So we hypothesize it's probably electrical properties. And we collaborated with Upinder Bhalla's lab at NCBS and his PhD student, Dipanjali Dwivedi. Uh, Suranjana took mice with her, the LHX2 mutant mice, and went and basically learned how to do these recordings with them. And to cut a long story short, we find that subplate born from LHX2 mutant progenitors, LHX2 mutant mother cells, such subplate cells are electrically dead, okay, or muted. There's an example, ignore this graph for lack of time. Simply look at this one example. Each spike in blue is a controlled subplate neuron whose uh, uh, membrane potential is changing dramatically because it's spiking, it's firing. It's saying on, on, on. Okay, this is the natural intrinsic firing of this neuron. And instead, a neuron that is born from an LHX stimulant subplate, red tricks, silent. Okay, it doesn't spike. The fraction of such silent neurons in the mutant is 88%. Whereas in the control, it's only 36%. This is spontaneous activity at the age E15 when the nerves are coming in and when they don't seem to notice the subplate and just go in and rush in in advance. Here is what's called evoked activity, which means when you inject current into the cells, then at least will you fire. Okay. And again, the control cell, when you inject different steps of current, we are in picoamps here. And when you inject different steps of 5, 5, 5, 10, 15, 20 picoamps, you get basically spiking. You get evoked, you know, elicited spiking for the duration in which you're injecting the current. Okay, 100 milliseconds is the scale bar in this case. And again, look at the mutant. Barely, I mean, hardly any, this is a particular single example of a neuron, but difficult to see spiking, right? And this is the population. So essentially, we think that loss of LHX2 from the mother cells that form the subplate renders the subplate cells dead electrically, silent and this may be why the sensory nerves do not invade. So this is the summary of this section, okay, which I've just talked about. You get premature ingrowth of sensory nerves and this causes subplate neurons to become electrically silent. Now, I'm going to now switch gears and talk about the other part, okay. This is about wiring. How does brain wire, sensory wiring take place? And these are our insights in this space. I'm now going to talk about a much earlier step. How do the structures know where to form in the first place? Okay, so switch gears a little bit. How do structures know where to form is a fundamental question of patterning. 
How is symmetry broken? How does a homogeneous structure know that I'm going to become A here and B here? This question was asked, not just of the brain, but of the entire body. You know, an egg is formed out of one cell becoming two, four, eight, sixteen. 16, uh, that's an early embryo. How does this egg know where to form the body axis? And this was solved by a Nobel Prize winning experiment of Speyman and Mangold using, using mute eggs, okay? This picture is actually frog eggs. I couldn't find mute eggs for you, but they did the experiment with mute. Um, Frog eggs are typically, they're cute, huh? they're like a, about a millimeter in diameter, maybe half a millimeter. You can see them with naked eye. Um, dark brown on the one side, light yellow on the other. And each egg forms an embryo like this, forms one long excess embryo. This is the eye, this is the head, you know, body and so on. Now what Fema and Mangal found is that while this embryo is developing, remember I showed you this massive cell movement occurring? They found one region of this moving, shifting embryo, which if they transplanted into another embryo, such that that embryo had two of them. Okay, so let me just, okay, so here, if they transplanted a second um, tissue here, they suddenly managed to, di to, uh, to duplicate the axis. They called this tissue that they transplanted the organizer. Not any old tissue would produce this entire second axis. Only a certain tissue of this massively migrating embryo, only that portion, if given to another embryo such that that embryo had two, only that would duplicate the axis. So they called it an organizer. This is the primary organizer because it doesn't itself contribute to the second embryo, okay? But it organizes form in the entire second embryo. It takes whatever local cells are around and basically tells them that, okay, you're head. You're also head because there's another organizer here. Okay, so two axes are formed. This broke open the sort of understanding of how complexity can come out of simplicity. If you have a sheet of cells that are all uniform, think of a sea of boats. All the boats are sort of uniform colored. Okay, and then think of a lighthouse. The lighthouse is sending signals. The boats nearest the lighthouse are going to see very strong signal. The boats far away will see weak signal. Similarly, an organizer secretes signaling molecules. And based on the gradient of signaling molecules that the cells, the boats receive, each cell knows what it's going to be. Each boat knows whether to turn up a red flag or a blue flag or a green flag. So patterning can be induced by simply you know, so you, you don't have to create red, blue, green, yellow, and whatever, pink cells, right? You simply create a lighthouse. And the cells, by the gradient of signaling that they receive from the lighthouse, will know what to do. This mechanism has played out again and again in every single part of the body. We were privileged to find the organizer for the hippocampus. The hippocampus is a brain structure that handles learning and memory. Okay. So here it is. The human hippocampus dissected out looks like a seahorse. So hippocampus, campus is a horse, fancifully named. We, when I say we, I mean this wonderful team of people, postdocs and, and veterinarians. Uh, this guy's a veterinarian, uh, 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 master's students, even an MD doctor, Lakshmi, a PhD student. Um, they took on a really dramatically challenging set of experiments. This was nobody's primary project. They all had other projects. And then at some point, this project just took over and consumed our interest. And what we were privileged to discover was this. Okay? So essentially, we discovered there is this signaling center in the middle of the brain. So remember I said the brain forms as a bulge or out of a tube. So if my fingernails, if you examine my fingernails like this, you will essentially see this cartoon that I'm drawing here, right? My fingernail is the bitten brain. And where my fingernails are is where there is a lighthouse in the brain. Okay, and that lighthouse sends signals such that the tissue right next to it forms the hippocampus. We didn't know this. We showed this by experiments that I'm going to summarize in the next two or three slides. So what we ended up doing was we created extra lighthouses. We created extra hens. And what we found was, whereas next to each normal hem develops the hippocampus, we probe for it using reagents that identify pink and blue regions of the hippocampus. 
and we found here next to each extra organizer, next to each extra lighthouse, we found pink and blue regions that were hippocampi. So here's the data. What we found was the same gene LHX2, which at a later stage controls the wiring of the sensory pathway. We found, so this is, this is a mRNA in situ. Every purple signal is simply a color reaction for where LHX2 mRNA is being expressed in the cell. What do I mean by expressed? All cells have the entire genome. They have the full library, right? But which book is read off from the library into messenger RNA decides which protein is going to be made. So these cells express the LHX2 mRNA and eventually make LHX2 protein. But note that this structure here, which I already told you was where my fingernails are, right, the hem, this does not express LHX2, okay? And it expresses instead a whole bunch of signaling molecules of this particular family, the wind family. Now, early on, the first study from my lab in 2001, actually, <laughs> this is work that I presented at PRL when it was hot off the press. When we mutate LHX2 in all these cells and we remove it, we find that, yeah, the entire cortex is shrunken, but still every available cell here can no more become cerebral cortex. It instead becomes hem. So what we hypothesized is that maybe the presence of LHX2 in all these cells here is suppressing, preventing them from becoming the hem. Okay, so presence of LHX2 here is in some sense protecting these cells from becoming the lighthouse and instead allowing them to become responding tissue. And you remove LHX2, you get one big lighthouse, but you have nobody left to respond to it. Okay, so while this sheds some light on what LHX2 might be doing, this did not allow us to create extra hems because here, while we have extra hem tissue, there is no responder tissue interspersed, right? It's just one giant big lighthouse. Okay, so what we did for this is that we decided to do a mosaic, okay? We literally, with the help of these wonderful people, uh, Satish Kumar, um, Mitra Das Panikkar, and Shamla Mani, we learned how to make mixed up embryos in which green fluorescent protein, green cells, were either controls, normal, or LHX2 mutant. And we mixed them up with non-green black cells in a nice little developing embryo, which we transplanted into a mouse and let it develop. Okay, so here is, for example, a mix and match where there are too many green cells and everybody's mutant, that we don't want. Here is some green, some not green, that we want. We want salt and pepper. And here's how it looks when it grows up and you cut it. So this is again a bilaterally symmetric view of the brain. Uh, and I'm going to show only one half from now on. So you can see these black stripes. These black stripes are simply streaks of cells that have arisen from mother cells that were black, not green. Okay. And in this control plus control situation, the green cells are also wild type, the black cells are wild type. So this is simply telling us that this contorted technique does not change the patterning. Okay. Cortex remains cortex, shown here with a cortex marker. Hem remains hem, shown here with a hem marker. And here is the mutant. Okay, I've, I've um, magnified the mutant a little bit. And you can see in this mutant, there are patches of green and patches of black. The green cells are now mutant. And you can see this square, this triangle matches up very well. Okay, I'm going to overlay these for you because they are actually the same section. Right, I can go back and forth. So basically, wherever there is a green patch, there, that patch cannot become cortex. It instead becomes hem. So there are black patches. Those black patches are cortex. So in this situation, we have finally created multiple lighthouses interspersed with normal responding tissue. And we could ask what happens. And what happens is indeed, as expected, we get multiple hippocampi. This is the shriveled away lighthouse um, sort of after a few days, it's no longer as big. This is the beginnings of the hippocampus. Here you have multiple green patches. Each of them is an extra lighthouse. And next to each extra lighthouse, you have multiple patches of hippocampal tissue. Um, I can show it to you at a little older age. You should ignore this large purple patch. And you should only look at this sort of uh, curved structure, which is the hippocampus. And you can see at this older age, here is one green lighthouse, another green lighthouse. And next to it, again, ignore this dark patch. 
but you can see one curve and maybe two curves and who knows third or not. The orientations of these curves are not all aligned. So which is why when you section them in one plane, you get a sort of not very CC shaped structure, but basically we have duplicated and multiplicated the hippocampus. We've created the Speyman mangold experiment in the brain. We've created a mouse with multiple hippocampi. The hippocampus handles learning and memory. Do these mice do better learning and memory? The answer is we can't test because these mice die in utero. But even if they survived, it would not be a very clean experiment to do because these extra hippocampi come from tissue that would otherwise form some other modality. Okay, it's not that the, the, the extra lighthouses are making the hippocampus proliferate, right? It's simply converting cells that would otherwise form something else into hippocampus. So it's not a very clean experiment to do because some other modality here is being taken out and instead you're getting extra hippocampus. But this shows fundamentally how the hippocampus is where it is. The hippocampus is where it is because the hem is where it is. And this concludes this portion of my talk. Okay, the hem is, is an organizer for the hippocampus. I'm going to sort of end with ongoing work that we are doing. Okay, what is the exciting future of this? Of course, what positions the hem, right? If, if the hippocampus forms next to my fingernails, which are the hem, then what makes the hem form where it is? We have some inroads on that. I'm not going to cover that right now. We are looking at other transcription factors that help to position the hem in the first place. But what I am going to talk about is something that has perplexed us from the beginning. Okay, what has perplexed us from the beginning is why doesn't the hippocampus form on the other side of the hem? When I show you my hand with my fingernail, the fingernail is the end of the road. But in the brain, the fingernail is not the end of the road. Dangling down from the fingernail is a ribbon-like tissue called the choroid plexus, which makes cerebrospinal fluid. So if this was, if my fingernail was the green hem, the brown Choroid plexus comes from the hem. It's dangling down there. It makes cerebrospinal fluid. How in the embryo does the wind signal know that it needs to go up and form the hippocampus? And how does it not go down? We don't actually know. But what we are looking at, what we have found, is that if we artificially force this choroid plexus to experience wind signaling, then this choroid plexus will indeed form neurons and very hippocampus-like neurons. So I'm going to just sort of show you a quick glimpse of that, that we are able to show that the choroid plexus forms neurons. And this is the work of um, a former postdoc, Malika Tachti, who's a faculty at Amity University, and two uh, senior PhD students, Arpan and Varun, they had this work published in Nature Communications just recently. We're very thrilled, I must say. And here is how we're going to show it, okay? Um, we're going to use, remember I said how in the first bit of the talk that we knocked out LHX2 only in the cortex. Now we are going to force this wind signaling to happen only in this tissue, only in this hem and choroid plexus, nowhere else. So it's a very clean perturbation. And here's what we find. I'm going to sort of just jump through this. This is a PCA analysis. Uh, principal component analysis of control and mutant hippocampus, the mutant being where this midline tissue is forced to experience wind signaling. See how the control, control choroid plexus is far from the mutant choroid plexus. In fact, the mutant choroid plexus is hanging out here near the hippocampus. And indeed, sequencing the RNA of the control and the mutant choroid plexus tells us that the choroid enriched genes have now gone down, blue is down regulated, and the hippocampus enriched genes are the ones that have come up. So forcing the choroid plexus to experience wind signaling is converting it into at least neuronal identity, if not hippocampal identity. And these are sections which I will just try and simplify for you. Normally, this marker which is expressed in neuronal stem cells is never there in the normal choroid plexus here, this outline. Nor is this hippocampal neuron marker there. Nor is this marker that identifies all neurons there. But here, look how this red staining here and this green staining here has come up in this wind active choroid plexus. So basically I've, I've shown you sort of uh, uh, visual evidence and quantitative evidence that this choroid plexus, which is experiencing a large amount of wind signaling is now looking neuronal. -like. And I want to end with saying that we have 
partially recapitulated this phenomenon in human embryonic stem cell derived organoids. Okay. Um, my student Varu, uh, Arpan uh, went to Orly Reiner's lab at the Weizmann and developed these organoids there. And the idea was that he would bring the technology back. And you make these uh, 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 human stem cell derived organoids by taking the human embryonic stem cells, aggregating them, adding you know goodies, morphogens to them, shaking them, and so on in a well-established protocol. And I just wanted to show you what they look like because organoids are, um, they've taken everybody's fancy. Everybody finds them very cool. <laughs> So here's what they look like. I hear they're rounds, day five, day 18. And then once you begin to induce normal choroid plexus development, you get these blebs. And these blebs are what form choroid plexus like identity along their peripheries. Okay. And this is the, the choroid plexus development in the mouse in the human organoid, and this is how it looks in a mouse. But if there are parallels. And RNA sequencing will tell you that indeed you have developed choroid like identity. Uh, between day 18 to day 30, all of the choroid specific genes go up. These three uh, rows are the three columns are three ends of the same thing. So here's three ends and three ends. By day 30, you really do have frank choroid differentiation. But if you add a drug that forces this organoid to experience too much wind signaling, you lose the choroid identity. And that's what I'm going to show you as my last bit of data. Hyperactivation of canonical wind signaling. Okay, so here is normal levels of wind signaling, and you can see that the, the red choroid plexus is there, is, uh, uh, is developing. If you add four times the amount, it just goes away. You don't see choroid anymore. There's a quantitation of that. And again, so what was red choroid genes become now blue. We just go away and we get, we get a hint of a hippocampal identity coming. So here, OTX, this green marker is a choroid marker. Uh, in a dose response, it basically gets suppressed and choroid identity goes away. ZBTB20 is a hippocampal marker and it comes up. So what I'm trying to say is, it looks like we have certainly neuronal identity, and possibly elements of hippocampal identity coming up in human embryonic stem cell derived organoids when they experience large amounts of wind signaling, which they normally are not supposed to. How do they protect themselves from experiencing too much wind signaling? That's a question for the next, uh, next project. That I don't know the answer to, but I'm now going to summarize. What is development? Okay, development is executing the instructions in the blueprint. Blueprint is formed by evolution. It's executed and developed. And what I have showed you today is our studies on how the wiring diagram of the brain was uh, um, executed using the model system of the sensory nerve pathway that has to innovate but has to wait at the subplate. And when LHX2 is lost from the subplate mother cells, stem cells, the subplate is electrically muted and the nerves go rushing in prematurely, which is really bad because later on they die. Then I took a step back and asked, how does entire structure get positioned correctly? And I showed you that the hippocampus forms where it does because the hem forms where it does and that the hem is an organizer for the hippocampus. And finally, I ended with how a tissue gets its identity. And I showed you how hyperactivation of wind signaling suppresses choroid plexus fate and induces neuronal or hippocampal like fate and that we could recapitulate some of this in human embryonic stem cell derived organoids. So with this, I will thank you. These were the three sort of uh, um, lines of uh, exploration that I would like to convey. But I must say all of this, all of this is aimed at eventually understanding what is the circuitry? What is the circuitry that allows a cat to do this? This is what motivates us, this is what drives us. How is the circuitry of the brain um, wired up to give us these fantastic illusions? And with this, I will close and uh, thank you for your attention. Deep questions. Wonderful talk. And uh, now we can start the question answer uh, session. And I request uh, Navinder to
initiate the question answer session. Navinder, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Shribar. Thank you. So, any questions? Uh, please, uh, you can uh, raise your hand or uh, you can uh, post your question in the chat box from where I, I will read, read out. Okay, there is a question from Nishtaji. Uh, please go ahead, Nishtaji. Mr. Yes, I have done. I have done it. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Shubha. It was a very interesting talk. I just wanted to know how is forgetting connected with the uh, linkages between the neurons? The linkages remain the same, but we forget sometimes the happy times and sometimes you forget the not good memories. So how can that change happen when either we should be remembering only the happy time? When the everything <laughs> is, or we should be not remembering that and remember only those. So when the neuron connections remain the same, how do we forget selectively? Ah, so the connections are not the same. Okay, uh, experiments have shown that a memory is stronger if it has charged emotional content. Okay, whether it's a happy memory or sad memory, uh, when it is when it is experienced together with charged emotion, me that memory is stronger. Okay, it is also selective. You're not going to remember. So if you experience a car crash, you're not going to remember every single thing about it. But the elements that you remember, you will remember clearly. And they will be with you for a long time. But okay, the, the, there's a change in the connection no, no, of the neuron. The, 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 the way it is encoded is just stronger. Okay, that's one. The other bit of uh, information I can give you is that every time you recall a memory becomes labeled, it actually is changeable. So if you recall something every year, you re-put it back into long-term memory in some sense, and it actually may change when you re-put it back. So the 20th time you remember something may not be the way you remembered it the first time. And yet, how would you know? Because the way you remember is the way you remember it. So, so recalling, re-recalling something is a way of keeping it with you forever, but it actually is also labile and changes every time you recall it. So basically, we are highly imperfect human beings, but we think that we remember. No, 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 I remember it. Correct. You have remembered it, you have made it open to change. And you can just uh, think about how complex the experimental design must have been for scientists to elicit this, right? So these are the two pieces of information I know about recall. But broadly about forgetting, it is simply thought to be that a memory is encoded. Um, um, how do you say it? Not that one neuron encodes one memory, but in a network, some connections are strengthened and some are not. So if you think of a bunch of, you know, 20,000 neurons connecting from point A to point B, and each of them with different patterns and so on, um, if you give each connection a number, you may have a long string of 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 for a memory, right? And if some of these connections become weak over time, you will still be able to elicit the whole pattern if enough of it is there. So sometimes you think you have heard this before. It's because enough of the pattern was there that triggered some other memory. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, the sense of having experienced it. So it's... This is sort of what the field knows. Um, I don't actually work in function. I work in how the circuitry forms in the first place. Structure, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, because this, the way the circuitry forms is finally what underlies the function. But these are the things that I know about this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, Professor Palam, please go ahead. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Shubha, it's been a very excellent and very informative and very fascinating talk. A lot of, lot of things, in fact, a lot of things to discuss. Maybe it's question and suggestion. You know, I can't ask only a couple of questions here. A lot of things to discuss. But I would, uh, I was wondering, you know, I, I, I was always fascinated by, you know, as you said, you know, how AI forms or what coloration of a, of a, you know, uh, a body of any, you know, uh, how things form, you know, and when you said this Mangold's organizer, you know, was, was, uh, was was the way in which this uh, happens it was very interesting to know i would definitely like to read more about that but what i wanted to ask is that 
several of these things are involuntarily happening. We don't know how things are happening, but everything is happening in voluntary, uh, involuntarily. And through evolution, a lot of things have started, have, have, the cells have trained themselves. So uh, how much you know, time or what is the time duration it takes for them to unlearn or, uh, or, or modify or, or you know, uh, uh, by the nature? Because now with various things that we are seeing in the nature, you know, the cells obviously are, are, are training themselves. So is there a kind of uh, you know, broad understanding of, uh, uh, of, of uh, how much time it takes uh, you know, in terms of uh, adjusting to the new environment? So, the developmental blueprint changes only through evolution. Okay. Yeah. It does not change through, uh, like, from one generation to the next. Yeah. But the circuit it produces is adaptive. The circuit it produces cannot be hardwired. Okay. Otherwise, we would never be able to adapt to new environments. Right. So, um, Certain circuits in animals are hardwired and they will execute them exactly the same way each time, regardless of what's around. But other circuits are adaptive and an animal can learn and can pick up a stick and, you know, poke a hole to get an insect out of it. Right. So we have very complex adaptive circuits and early experience. So you see a child doing this, right? I mean, a child is a nervous system in training. If you watch a child crawl across something and pick pick up two things, I mean, like you watch a child trying to clap for the first time. This is not an easy task because two completely different objects have to be, you know, two halves of the entire nervous system have to sort of come together. It'll do this, it'll do this. But once it figures out how to connect, it will do it again and again and again. Right. Um, picking up a bat and hitting a ball. It's a very adaptive process, right? You try and instruct a time program code for how how a bat should be swung to hit a ball, right? It's a very adaptive process. So we're doing it all the time. And uh, the sad thing is, I think we don't recognize that our systems are adaptive. We cling to what we know. We cling to our beliefs. Even your beliefs are adaptive. All we have to do is accept that they are and allow ourselves to learn new things. No? You take yourself to a device that they say travel broadens the mind. You take yourself to a different culture. You see, array, you know, this was my response to a burrito. Okay. Good God. How can you put rice inside a chapati and roll it up in Egypt? But it tasted nice. Right? So we have to only allow ourselves to adapt. The nervous system is one hell of an adaptive device. If I may take a little time, I'm going to give you an example. Think of the simple task of reading. Reading black letters on a white paper. Reading. Reading was never evolutionarily programmed. Okay, think of a tiger or a monkey. What, what is reading, right? What we have done is we have taken our ability to detect high contrast lines on a background. We have taken our shape recognition. Okay, that entire shape. When you, learn, when you read any script fluently, you don't read one, one letter at a time. Okay, so I used to be able to read Hindi and Marathi properly, fluently. Now I read it one letter at a time. It takes me forever. But otherwise, you just take the shape of the word and you can read on. right? Whatever script you're familiar with. We do a shape recognition on that script. Having taken that shape into our brains, we plug it into our language module where that shape means something. Right? Dukh raha hai, bhag jao. All these things mean something. These words mean something. And based on that, we execute action. And all it comes from is our brain's ability to perceive high contrast lines on piece of paper and form shape recognition on them. This is a very strange activity, but we teach ourselves this. Yeah, this was not evolutionary programmed at all. It's a very, very recent activity. And if you never teach a child to read, it's never easy read, ever. Okay. And yet we do it, no? Yeah. So, yeah. So my point is, we absolutely are adaptive. We so just have to... Just to extend this, you know, uh, so the adaptive activity has to be trained because a child will know how to eat or digest because it, the cells are doing it. But for reading, we have to teach a child how to how to read again. So it is, it is, uh, you know, what I was. Uh, so this is the adaptive activity has to be has to be trained. Uh, well, not necessarily consciously, right? 
some people are just more open minded and they will learn from things that other people don't even imagine no yeah. i mean you take the example of a burrito some people will go to a mexican restaurant eat a burrito come back others will say are yaar aisa bhi ho sakta hai they will invent five new dishes at home so what do you do out of your experiences up to you hey, this is what i tell my phd students you unleash 20 phd students in a lab give them the same experiences they're all going to learn different things right thank you so much i think there are a lot of more maybe when you are here in person when we meet probably we'll discuss more because i have several hands raised so i would like to know thank sure, you sure. yeah so next question is by som sharma uh, thank you namita uh, that was a really fantastic talk with me not only listen we saw did the full that full talk though we are not from the field madam thank you very much uh, just i have very quick to uh, basically uh, doubt whether as you told that uh, there are different parts of the brain are assigned different thing like sensual visual and memory and other things so whether they are same in each brain or they are changing like from person to person number one no 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 the blueprint is hard hard set and that's one of the fantastic every time a little mammal is born every cat every mouse every cow every human they all have the visual cortex here this mechanism is so robust this is messed up too many other things in the body are messed up such an embryo would never get born oh that's 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 very, very nice another thing like that uh, so called iq or intelligence whether it depends upon um, the connectivity of the neuron or some other property of the neuron because every person has different iq different you can say intelligence level so that just can you please tell us uh, nice question may i modify your phrase iq to simply ability Yes, you can say ability or intelligence. IQ is one stupid test, right? Yeah. If you ask, if you ask all of us to walk on a very thin line, yeah. some will be terribly imbalanced. Some will dance across it as if they were born to do do it, right? That is neuronal function, right? The ability to keep balance on a very narrow thing is a neuronal function. Um, some of us can just sing a tune up and down. Some of us will go wonky. again that is neuronal function there are so many neuronal functions that are you know uh, variable iq is just one one test i can think of 800 different tests right, on which we are variable and yes this is all uh, it all arises from circuitry okay oh. some of the circuitry is genetic in that some circuits are predisposed to being uh, you know this is what you inherited from your parents a good amount of it is actually environmental it is learned so so for example i am unlikely to ever become a olympic runner okay i just don't have the basic genetic endowment for it within a strata so you know if olympic runners are on this level and then there is this and this and this and this level within my level if i had done a lot of workout in this level i could have gone all the way to the top even transcended a level you know playing the piano all of these things everything can be learned and the training you give your circuits early on will allow you to go very very far even transcend a few levels at some point you're going to be limited by the genetic endowment of what it is you have right but most things worth doing most things worth doing are actually within your reach to a level that will fulfill you now if it's your dream to become a 100 meter sprinter then wo thoda mushkil hai that you need a whole bunch of things to line up but most things worth doing you can do to a level that will fulfill you if you invest the time in it this should be told to kids early on because the younger you are the more likely you are to reach a level of satisfaction thank you thank you so much thank you sir yeah professor tole i have one question uh, uh, before i take uh, one question from the chat so my question is related uh, a little bit uh, to Pro uh, professor soms question also so this is regarding consciousness so if we look uh, start from yeah <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So we start from a single cell bacteria, for example, and then uh, layer by layer, another. I mean, go about in the life, like like fish, then fish to uh, say dog, and then uh, elephant, human being. So the consciousness, you know, I mean, uh, so uh, so so it is uh, sort of definitely the humans are more conscious uh, than animals. But the thing is that, for example, elephant has a bigger brain. So my question is, how the morphology of the connectivities of the structures? how that morphology the uh, relates with the consciousness the level of consciousness 
Is there any? Okay, I can't answer. I can't answer consciousness at all, but I can direct you to some um, um, reading material. There are people who have actually studied and thought about this, who know more than me. Okay, so I can suggest reading, but I can talk about bigger brains and smaller brains. Um, what is the job of the brain? The job of the brain is to be a control system for the body. Okay, everything else that comes out of it, you know, um, the ability to read, the ability to philosophize, the ability to do research, all that is like extra. Okay, none of that is, uh, uh, none of that is required for propagation of the species. But the brain has to be a control system for the body. What does it mean control system for the body? It means that you have to get sensation from the whole body and you have to execute motor functions for the whole body, movement. Abhi elephant ki body dekho. To manage that body, how much of brain you're going to need, right? Right. So large brains scale with large bodies because you have to manage the whole body. So the relevant metric is not absolute brain size, but brain to body ratio. And brain to body ratio, humans score very, very high. Yes. Okay. So the elephant would not be a useful example. It is a huge body. The job yeah. of the brain is to be a control system for the body. It's yeah, a very humble job. And everything else is, is everything else is you know extra. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you very much. Now my next question is uh, related to this uh, uh, this uh, ability to perform uh, at the elite level, I mean, the ability to perform uh, uh, exceptionally uh, well in, in various domains of the arts or science or sports. So, so there is a theory by Erickson. Uh, Erickson. So he argues that uh, uh, the, initially it was believed that the genetics plays the main role, but then he argues, as you argued, that it is the it is the training. I mean, the, the, the exceptional athletes or the Olympic level athletes, they train, they start the training at very early on. Uh, at a very, I mean, when they are child, they, they start the training and over the years or decades actually, their, their training make them the best, not the genetics. So he argues that genetic factors uh, may be important, but it is the, it is the training, it is what he calls, uh, uh, is the, he gives a special name to the training, I mean, uh, the, the deliberate practice, he calls it a deliberate practice. So it is, it is his argument is that. So, so uh, I mean, so then, uh, do we should we believe that uh, the, the genetics uh, uh, does not play any role, much role, uh, significant uh, related to as uh, you argued, because it is the genetics which go on the side uh, of the brain. There is, there is no need. There is no argument that both are critical. Okay, so um, it's easy to say, oh, people thought genes were important, but it is environment. Or, oh, people thought, you know, I'm saying, well, the genes set the broad parameters, right? And within that, it is training and experience that helps you improve. So without a genetic predisposition, you are not going to be in that category. And within that category, you can even transcend a few categories, but sooner or later, you're going to be. So look um, how tall you are. Okay? How tall you are is uh, very, very uh, largely controlled by your genes, right? Some yeah, that's true. That's but the mental abilities. Nutrition. Is, Sorry? The mental abilities. Yes, physical. But yes. Not, the, the physical abilities are just a map for the mental abilities, right? Any ability, any feature, any feature is absolutely controlled by the genes and modifiable by the environment to different extents. Height is modifiable by nutrition, for example. Okay. Uh, mental abilities are modifiable by training. Uh, the ability to, you know, do gymnastics or, uh, you know, um, uh, sprint marathons and so on are modifiable by training. The extent of the modification is going to be limited by what your internal hardware is, right? Mm -hmm. So I am not at all arguing for one or the other. I'm basically saying there is a, uh, there is a place for the genetic framework and then there is a place for experimental modification. Environment. Thank you, thank you very much. So now I read one question in the chat box. So it is from Atif. So he asked what happens in the brain when people are zoned out at times and why and how brain dissociates attention from outward sensations. Um, I must say, I actually am not going to be able to give an informed scientific answer to this one. It's a very cool question. 
It's something I would like to know. But uh, Google search will tell you what it will tell me. What happens to the brain when it is zoned out? I mean, your description would be as good as mine. Okay. When one is not attentive to something, one is considered to be zoned out. One is not um, focusing on the sensory experience of the outside world. So typically, when we want to think deeply about something, we close our eyes. When you want to meditate, you close your eyes. You're trying to avoid being distracted by the outer sen sensations of the outside world. You want to be in your thoughts. Being zoned out is not necessarily wanting to be in your thoughts. But uh, it's paying attention to different parts of your own brain's abilities. Uh, you might be thinking very, very hard of trying to remember a piece of music or a tune. And when you're doing that, you are not able to feel or notice any other sensation. We have all had experiences, a, a musical tune or some word that you want to remember or I don't know, some piece of analysis or equation or some bit of data, when you are deeply in something, you are actually dead into everything else. So that is our attentional mechanism at play, and that's the best I can do. Yeah. So yeah. So there is another question uh, in the chat box. Uh, this is by uh, this is from Kudrang. So he asks, uh, people experience sleep deprivation very often due to their lifestyle or work or obligation. So is it possible that due to this continuous sleep deprivation at a certain point, we might overcome such uh, stress? Uh, so he writes S-T-R-W, stree. So this is his question. Um, I didn't actually get the question. Is it possible with can you read it? Yeah, uh, okay. can you read it? Uh, I hope the, the chat box is visible to you. I don't actually see a chat box. I will repeat. Yeah. So people experience sleep deprivation very often due to their lifestyle or work obligation. So is it possible that due to this continuous sleep deprivation at a certain point, we might overcome such stress? Stress. Such stress. Yeah. stress. Spelling mistake. Stress. Yeah. Um, okay. Sleep deprivation is bad for you. Okay. Um, if you continuously sleep deprived, when you when you allow your body to sleep, your body will recoup all the sleep debt. Um, sleep is important. The reasons why sleep is important have been a subject of intense study for decades. We are now beginning to find out why. Uh, during sleep, you consolidate memories. If you learn something, this has been shown in flies and mice and humans. If you learn something and you sleep, those that sleeping period allows you to consolidate it. I will give you a popular example. If you have tried to learn any complicated motor thing, take learning a bicycle or take some tabla piece or something on the sitar or anything that requires motor activity is just easier as an example. Right? If you do many, many, many training periods, okay, one hour in the morning, one hour in the afternoon, one hour in the evening, it will not help you learn as much as one hour today, sleep, one hour tomorrow, sleep, one hour. This we know. Okay, this we know. That there's something that happens overnight. Sometimes we sleep over something and then the answer is available to us the next day. Morning, yeah. I had to consolidate learning. Okay. Um, sleep is required to, um, there are now popular science articles on how uh, during sleep, the cells of the brain slightly shrink and all the gaps between them wash out all the toxins and everything. <laughs> there are popular science articles on this. So sleep is needed to clean out uh, all of the um, metabolites from the brain. Um, Sleep is needed to reinforce connections. There are even studies that show sleep is needed to create new ones. Okay, uh, so there is no such thing as adapting to sleep deprivation. What you're simply doing is accepting a lower and lower level of brain function. Don't do it. Allow yourself to sleep. There is nothing to be gained by that. There is no um, lifestyle demand that is that important. That is my suggestion. Thank you. So there is another question uh, from uh, Harish. Harish, can you? Uh, Hello. Uh, Hello, Professor Tole. First of all, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, my question is about the evolutionary benefit of the structure. So the way the brain structures are there because there is an evolutionary benefit to it, or is it uh, dictated by the biochemistry and the rules of the physics? Um, so, so, um... Everything forms because there is evolutionary benefit, but evolution always acts in context. 
And evolution is limited by the fact that it can't throw out something just for optimization or beauty or something. Right? You can't throw it out unless it prevents the propagation of the species. I'll give our whole genome as an example. Our genome is the messiest place in the universe. Okay, we have whatever, some 30,000 genes. Over time, viruses came in and sat in the middle. The bits and things came in the middle. So now all our genes are broken up. What has evolution done? Come up with splicing machinery. So when you translate this, transcribe this gene into a long piece of RNA, now you have joining machinery that joins those bits. Mm -hmm. Took advantage of it saying, Array, if I have to join 20 bits, then maybe I can create a new messenger RNA by taking bit number 13579 and making a new protein out of it. And then students study it saying the advantage of splicing is that you can make many different types of proteins from one gene. Array, yeah, that gene got broken up in the first place. Evolution capitalized on it. You see, no sense, there is no method in all sense in this. It is just that which kills your propagation of species is gone. That which allows propagation of species, it's a bunch of band-aids and a bunch of <laughs> fix-it mechanisms, but the species propagated. Those got retaped. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Madam. It's a little terrifying. It is a little <laughs> terrifying and <laughs> at the same time. We should not take ourselves too seriously, nor our abilities and everything. If the bacteria from which we all evolved had, you know, evolved next to a volcano that was outputting, I don't know, uh, you know, phosphorus instead of sulfur, we would all be different today. It's just that there's, there's no sense in all of this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Professor Nandita. Yeah, thank you, Professor Shubha, for very stimulating talk. I want to get back to your original uh, first, second slide, wherein you described about the uh, sensory organs, like five sensory organs, and you took the example of uh, um, of the eye as the first example. So I wanted to ask when the child is born, suppose the brain, I mean, one of the organs is not developed or is damaged when it is born. Uh, how does the brain train that uh, uh, brain knows that I or the uh, if he's that if he's dead uh, deaf, then how it knows how to use the other sensory organs? Uh, because we we always say that since he is blind, he or he is using other sensory organs to sense the thing. I mean, from the very childhood when the brain is formed, is absolutely perfect? the amazing flexibility of cortex. Okay, so remember I said visual cortex and sensory cortex touch. So the two cortices are right next to each other. In congenitally blind people, the sensory nerve fibers take cortex. They actually just use the territory. No cortex is around unused. If out of your five fingers, you've lost one finger, okay, other fingers will take over that territory in the brain and use it. So yes, absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions? So, Professor Anil Vadavaj, you need to unmute yourself. Mm, thank you, Shubha, for an excellent talk. And uh, it's, it's really good to get some knowledge in these areas, you know, where we don't work and how our brain works and how the training of the brain happens, actually. Uh, I was just trying to understand uh, that there are two aspects which is coming out from what I understand from you is one is the way we are born and we have and that came out from the blueprint which is there as the things developed and then the human comes. And the second aspect is the training aspect which is uh, what we in the current uh, scenarios calls is that machine learning or artificial intelligence kind of thing. So we trained our brain right from our childhood and that is how you know the child learns of uh, knowing certain things, working certain ways and seeing how things are happening nearby, it trains and, and learns. So we are actually training as we are growing ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then there comes the language training also as we read, you know, and we hear from our parents what they are ta talking and then we start saying those words and things like that. So, so it, it's more like, uh, there are certain aspects which is built in into the system 
like a computer there are certain aspect which is already there and then you know that what you called uh, uh, your uh, this one programming you know so microsoft has so pc mein microsoft ko hai okay <laughs> now using that microsoft what is your ability to do is your own and how much you can train that computer and utilize that hardware and software of the computer to do it so i was just putting in in that kind of thought that the brain is tunable to many things according to what we can do only the ability to it is decided by the genes in that is that the way the analogy can be taken up that your ability to do certain things is decided by the genes but the training is actually depending upon how you learn in as you live um i would say genes and experience training both um modify your circuits and your abilities come from your circuits so i wouldn't put a but there there is too much of this nature versus things and mind there is too much of butism people always try and you know center stage one versus the other i'm saying it all it's like saying let me use a, a cooking analogy i don't know if you cook but you need good ingredients and you need a good recipe right the best tastiest of ingredients i'm going to go anywhere if you don't have a proper recipe and a good recipe can make up for having slightly substandard ingredients right but there's a limit to how much you know if your uh, dhania is not actually flavorful there's a you can you can go around it and use this and that and the other and compensate for it to a great extent the same as having fabulous ingredients and fabulous recipe but if so, you are not a good cook then whatever is available still you will mess it up <laughs> yeah so for recipe i didn't want to i didn't want to bring a person into it so my recipe was saying right there is so there is the nature they, they both are needed no and they both modify circuitry okay you're taking that analogy i was trying to that if you don't have that kind of genes which makes you a good cook then whatever is available to you still you will not be able to do it right no. i would say a good cook can produce a good meal with with the dhania that is tasteless and pyaaz that is not i mean you know when you when you go to a farm you get really the best of ingredients right what you get in big cities the ingredients are not good mm. but a good cook can always compensate for whatever the ingredient was so there is no there are no uh, final answers in this you know unless you want to go win a gold medal in the olympics 100 meter race now that is for most of us that is probably not in our futures no matter how hard you try it's, but most things that are worth achieving are achievable is my is my all right 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 um, there are limitations though uh, if you don't have good early nutrition okay if you don't have good early nutrition and i'm talking about antenatal nutrition when you're still in the mother's womb that changes everything changes everything so there is genes and then there is epigenetics epigenetics are modifying marks on the genes that you know allow them to be expressed to different extents so many things control circuitry from which behavior arises so i would not go into absolutes that you might not have this and you might have that and but i would never go into absolutes there are so many things that control the process so i would never write oneself off i'm sort of saying this to students who might be in the audience we're giving ourselves a rejection slip <laughs> there's always possibilities right if that's there's possibilities you will go farther than if you thought there weren't possibilities now where would you put that in your cooking there's a right it's simply thinking that you can this allows you to go farther okay great thank you yeah uh, thank you professor tolli so uh, uh, we have to terminate this nice discussion uh, because of time constraint uh, i am sure there uh, would be more questions from the audience uh, but uh, sorry for this so i request my colleague manas to conclude the session uh, thank you professor navindra uh, friends it is an honor for me to propose vote of thanks to all who have helped us in making today's vacation possible 
Uh, first of all, on behalf of entire PRL, I would like to thank uh, today's speaker, uh, Professor Tolle, for accepting our invitation and agreeing to share her knowledge and wisdom with us. It was truly a wonderful talk, talking about very fine structure of brain and their functionality uh, in a very simplistic way. I think we learned a lot and we possibly learned a lot from in future. So uh, I also, I mean, uh, uh, thank Professor Tule for uh, uh, answering, especially answering all the questions posed by our members. Uh, and once again, thank you for your time. Uh, many, many thanks to Professor Anil Bharadwaj, Director of PRL, Professor Pallam Raju, Dean PRL, and also all the Vakyan Committee members for their continuous effort uh, in making this Vakyan series keep going. Uh, thanks to Professor Swati Goswami for all the support and help uh, in today's Vakyan, uh, and constantly chipping in whenever it is uh, we, we need her. Uh, finally, I would like to extend our special thanks to all our participants who have joined us through OBEX and the YouTube platforms. Thank you all for your time. With this, we come to the very end of today's uh, chapter of PRL's Amrut Vakyan. See you next time with another eight interesting uh, Vakyan. Till then, on behalf of PRL, goodbye to you all. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pleasure to have been here. Thank you.